Okay, <clears throat> this presentation is, is a lot more detailed about scaffolding. Uh, we talked about the methods of cognitive apprenticeships in an earlier presentation. The methods included uh, modeling, scaffolding, and coaching, uh, and articulation and reflection and exploration. And this presentation goes into a lot more detail on the particular method of scaffolding. Uh, the idea of scaffolding has been around for a long time. The idea of cognitive apprenticeships uh, was initiated in, in 1989, and so, uh, but the idea of scaffolding in the U.S. has been um, primarily uh, Jerome Bruner is the spearhead of, of the idea of scaffolding, um, but it's also based on um, um, Vygotsky, so, so it has some, some history. Um, it's about support, uh, both giving it and fading and taking it away, which would be fading. So you give, the key is just uh, the right amount of support and, and to move to a position where you're not providing that support at all because the goal is to uh, have the learner be independent, uh, that they don't need the scaffolding. Again, it, it is based uh, on Lev Vygotsky as well. Um, and here are some of the elements of Lev Vygotsky that we talked about in an earlier presentation on, on Vygotsky's theories. Uh, there's a more knowledgeable other. I think of that earlier presentation, we not only talked about parent, teacher, and peer, but we also talked about the computer. There was a question mark about it. And so as we look at scaffolding in a little bit more detail today, you'll see that the there ought to be more than one question mark next to the computer. You might even include a question mark next to uh, peers as well, uh, as we learn more about what, what it means to, to provide scaffolding. Um, and key elements of it include the idea of zone of proximal development. Um, scaffolding is based on the zone of proximal development and the more knowledgeable other uh, concepts of Vygotsky. So those are, uh, Bruner derived those from Vygotsky. There's five specific identifiable features of scaffolding. It, um, scaffolding includes intentionality, a clear overall purpose, and that's not only the clear overall purpose for the learner, but that clear overall purpose is understood by the teacher as well. Appropriateness, the task is fitting the student's prior knowledge. Again, it needs to fit into that zone of proximal development. It doesn't need to, if it's outside of the scope, either as something that they already know or that they're not able to do, even if you were supporting them, uh, then it's not appropriate. <coughs> Structure. <coughs> Structure is a key element of this. There needs to be a natural, comprehensible sequence of thought and language in the in the scaffolding support. Uh, collaboration teacher is the collaborator more than an evaluator. <coughs> Excuse me. Internalization moves uh, towards student ownership of the learning. Again, the idea of scaffolding with fading is that the, the student becomes the, the, the oh, you know, the, the, the they're the, the owners of the knowledge, that they, that they are able to do it without any support. That's, and that's the end state goal of scaffolding and teaching and learning always. All right. <coughs> so in addition to that, there are six general elements of scaffolding. Sharing a specific goal. The, the, there needs to be a clear understanding on both the learner's part and the, and the teacher's part about what the specific goal is uh, in the task. The second thing, which uh, is re a reiteration of, um, of the Vygotsky notion, is that it needs to be a whole task approach. You don't break things down into the components and teach the individual components. What you do is you have the learner engaged in the whole task, whatever it is, the whole problem solving the whole task creation, whatever it is, and then you support them uh, rather than uh, another way of, of providing support, a different strategy for teaching would be to take a really complex thing, break it down into its individual components, and then teach those specific components. Uh, and that's an approach that has been popular in the United States for many years, but that is not uh, what the approach is with scaffolding. The scaffolding is you don't break it down into its component parts. You give them the whole thing, and then you you, uh, 
you make it less complex by providing the, the support and doing the whole task. There needs to be immediate availability of help. And this, this might place a question mark next to teacher. If you've got 30 kids in the class, how do you provide, uh, how are you available as the immediate available uh, help provider? Intention assisting. Um, so again, you need to under, you need to be watching what they're doing and know what they're trying to achieve. They may be trying to achieve some sort of sub goal towards the the overall goal the goal of the project, and you need to know what that sub goal is in order to provide them with the assistance on that specific sub goal. You need to know what they're trying to achieve. You need to provide, and this is this is more of an art than a science, but you need to provide the optimal level of help. You don't want to provide them with too much help, you don't want to provide them with too little help. Uh, too much help would get them uh, in, a, um, um, in a, a mindset where they, they've lost ownership, and too little help, they, they get frustrated. And again, going back to this idea of an overall structure, um, this is a key element in providing the help, is to help them understand an expert model for whatever the domain is. All right, so let's take each one of these in, in, in sequence. Sharing a specific goal. Uh, consideration of the student's needs. You need to uh, understand their needs and, and what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, you need to allow student input. You need to understand what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And so, this is probably the most com one of the most complex parts of scaffolding. This is this understanding uh, that needs to occur between the person providing the scaffolding and, and the learner themselves. The whole task approach, overall tasks, keep goal and in, in kept in focus. Sub skills viewed in light of the whole. Uh, I have seen uh, points where where with what the scaffolding is, is they get to a point where they need to know a specific skill, you might stop at that point and teach that specific skill, uh, whatever that might happen to be, uh, grammar or, or, or a mathematical skill or whatever the skill happens to be. But it's done in the context of the whole task, and so it's, it's clear that, that you're doing that to achieve that sub-goal. Immediate availability of help, emphasis on frequent success. Uh, I mean, uh, in order for the student to stay motivated, they need to have some success. Uh, making students' time and effort more productive. Optimizing uh, challenge. And so again, you want to just give just the right amount of help. You want to be there for that help. Uh, otherwise, uh, they, they may get frustrated. Um, and so the, the, the challenge will be overwhelming. But you don't want to give too much help. Intention assisting, accept a student efforts of strategies working. Again, uh, it might not be the best strategy, but if that's what they're doing and it will be successful, you should let them go with that strategy. You can, you can, you can um, come back to that and talk about that at a later point, uh, like in, in some sort of a reflection activity. But if, that, if it's a strategy that will work, even if it's not the optimal strategy, it, it's OK to let them go down that path. And you really only need to redirect them if it's not an effective strategy. Optimal level of help, and I have pointed on this about in the part on immediate availability of help, but optimal level of help is key, giving just the right amount of help. And I think the classic example was when my son was younger, he was working on blocks, and he wanted some help with blocks. If I gave him too much help, He'd abandon whatever it was that he was building because it wasn't his anymore. Uh, he, it, I needed to understand just how much I was supposed to help him uh, so that he could maintain, uh, so he wouldn't get fr too frustrated, but he would uh, that, that not too much so that he didn't lose ownership. So it's a it's a really delicate balance that you have to you have to achieve. And 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 I would say that some some people are good at this, some people aren't. So when you when I have my list, parents, teachers, and peers as possible providers of scaffolding, uh, it needs to be a person who's able to to figure out what the optimal level of help is. 
And then conveying an expert model. Uh, explicit modeling uh, techniques are clearly represented. Uh, implicit modeling, the learner uses prior knowledge to interpret them, um, the model, or prior experience to interpret it, or their experience in the articula articulation and reflection phase uh, of the process. All right, so uh, if I were to summarize this, scaffolding is incredibly complex. It really requires a close relationship with the learner, between the learner and the provider of the scaffolding. Uh, scaffolding is a method for teachers to play the role of the guide on the side. So this is a strategy for moving to the guide on the side. It requires an understanding of the learner on multiple dimensions, uh, not only in terms of what they're trying to achieve with the goal, but their emotional state as well. Um, okay, so that's just a, a brief summary of the chapter on scaffolding. Uh, it's uh, got a lot more detail than the cognitive apprenticeship chapter, which just kind of introduces the idea of scaffolding. Um, but hopefully this will help you in, in using this strategy in the teaching context uh, that you work in. Thanks. Talk to you later.